uh, Legal Services Trust Fund Commission Eligibility and Budget Committee. <clears throat> and um, we'll take roll in a second. I will announce that <clears throat> there's one small thing that's right in the world today, which is that the Los Angeles Dodgers are the world champions. So congratulations, Dodgers. Uh, Vicki, do you need to um, do you need to to read the riot act or the rules for us or somebody? Um, let's see. I'll have I'll have Kim do it since I'm um, still promoting some people and trying to figure out who they are. <laughs> okay, right. I'll I'll go ahead and start. Welcome, uh, committee members, liaisons, and members of the public to the Legal Services Trust Fund Eligibility and Budget Review Committee meeting. We will begin shortly. <clears throat> We are using Zoom with the goal to foster a more inclusive environment and effective meeting. If you would like to comment during the meeting, please type I have a comment or I have a question in the chat and a message will be sent to the host. Alternatively, you can use the raise hand feature. In efforts of transparency for those joining this meet <clears throat> this public meeting, whether by phone or by Zoom, we request that you refrain from having side conversations on chat about the content of the meeting Again, the chat feature is utilized simply as a tool for you to virtually indicate you have <clears throat> you would like to speak in order to help the chair facilitate the meeting. Moving forward, this meeting will is being recorded and will be posted on the State Bar's website at a later date. A friendly reminder that this meeting is video conference and to please be aware of the surroundings behind you. For those joining on computer when on mute, holding the space bar down will temporarily unmute you. If you use your phone to dial into the meeting, please be sure that your computer microphone is on mute to avoid audio feedback. While joining audio via computer, it is highly recommended if an individual loses audio, they can call in separately using the Zoom conference number. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Kim. Um, <clears throat> so why don't we take a roll call? Uh, Erica, do you wanna do that or? Sure, yeah. Good morning, everybody. Um, Iskin. Uh, here. Akloggy. Bales Fightmaster. Here, and I need to say that I'm a Giants fan, Eric, so I am not happy today. <laughs> 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 Maybe next year. <laughs> uh, Bennett? Present. Uh, Connolly? Here. DeBose? Here, and the Giants will never win. Dodgers will win again next year. <laughs> I shouldn't have started that. <laughs> uh, Delfino? I'm here and I hate to pile on, but uh, go Dodgers. Uh, Friedman? Here. Ma'am? Here. Uh, Meeker? Here. Myers? And Savage. Oh, Plantle? Yes, here. And Savage? Here. Um, and then I'll go through our liaisons. Um, Selena Copeland from LAC. I'm present. Um, Bonnie Huff from the Judicial Council. Uh, Christine Ganong from the Board of Trustees. Okay. And then I'll just go through staff as well. Um, Duan Nguyen. Oh, here, Erica. Sorry. That's okay. And Brady Dewar. Hey, here. Oh, and I was, there, there I am. <laughs> um, Is anyone else? Okay, sorry, Erica, go ahead. No, it's okay. That's, yeah, that's all. Is, is anyone else here from staff, State Bar staff? Do we have any members of the public here? Uh, there are two members of the public. I'm going to temporarily allow them to speak. Um, Andrew Kane wishes to make public comment. Andrew, I'm going to uh, unmute you. Hi, good morning, uh, members of the committee. And first, I just want to acknowledge that Commissioner Bales Fightmaster is actually being a little bit shy. She's also a little bit of a Red Sox fan, too. So Dodgers fans, go a bit easy on her, please. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Andrew Kane. I am an attorney with the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. Uh, we are located in San Jose. 
We serve several thousand Santa Clara County residents each year through legal services in three core projects, children and youth, which I am the directing attorney of, and housing as well as health. The reason that I'm making a comment today is that we are longtime recipients of funding through the IALTA program. Recently, through the application for the upcoming year, we sought to change the scope of our project um, to help fund work that we have been doing for over a decade in our juvenile dependency practice. And I wanted to share with the committee uh, a little bit of the reasoning why we chose that and, and ask the committee to offer some consideration to whether our application to change our funding to support juvenile dependency can be approved. I think uh, most folks on the committee are probably aware that juvenile dependency does have dedica a dedicated funding source through the state budget and also more recently through the federal Title IV program. But that funding is not nearly enough to cover the full scope of expenses of any provider across the 58 counties in California, all of which who are serving children and parents in these, uh, these cases in which our populations are at their most vulnerable when the government has intervened to remove children from their parents. And our ability to be able to provide as high quality service as these families need through an interdisciplinary model where we provide legal services through attorney social work teams is incumbent on us being able to have full funding. So we are hopeful that through IOLTA, which even with the IOLTA funding, we still wouldn't achieve full funding for our practice, but we are hopeful that there can be con uh, additional consideration given to our ability to do this. We would not be the only organization that has been uh, approved to be able to receive IELTA funding. And I ask the committee to give full consideration to our application. Thank you. All right, Th thank you, Andrew. And we may have, uh, the committee members, <clears throat> I, I don't think have the full background yet to what you're saying, but um, <clears throat> for those uh, who are not fully aware of what Andrew's talking about, this is an item that's gonna come up a little bit later uh, on this morning's agenda. And Andrew, we may have occasion to kind of come back to you. Are you gonna hang on um, throughout the meeting as we may have occasion to come back to you with, with some questions? Unfortunately, are there any other members? 9.30 to noon straight. Um, if there is a time frame, I can try to juggle things around and jump back on. All right, well, we'll, we'll, we'll do the, we may get to it by, by then, but uh, if not, if we have some questions uh, to follow up, we may just get to you later. Thank you. Um, uh, so thanks for your comments. Are there any other members of the public on the call or in the meeting? Okay. Um, so Actually, Sorry, um, this is Preeti Mishra from Dependency Advocacy Center. I'm also present. I don't have a specific public comment, but I am available if the committee has any questions because I know we're noted on the agenda later today. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay, so the first item of business is the approval of the uh, action summary from our last meeting on August 14th, which seems like two centuries ago. Uh, is there any discussion on that item? Do we have a motion for approval of that action summary? I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes from August 14, 2020. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Okay. I'll take the roll. Um, Iskin? Yes. Cloggy? Yes. Bell's Fightmaster? Yes. Uh, Bennett? Yes. Uh, Connolly? Yes. DeBose? Yes. Delfino? Yes. Friedman? Yes. Mann? Yes. Uh, Meeker? Yes. Myers? Uh, Plantle? Yes. And Savage? Yes. Passes. Right. So you may recall uh, that at the last meeting, there were one, one of the outstanding items was that there were a couple of organizations that were late in the submission of their financial audits, um, Neighborhood Legal Services and Chalk Children's. So um, we have on the agenda a brief update on the submission of, of financial statements from those organizations. So Eric, are we going to handle that? Yeah. Yes. Um, Eric, I was wondering if... Um, if Andrew is still on the line, if we want to ask him just a few questions currently in case he has to drop off, just some uh, that 
staff yeah. may be aware of. I know that okay. the committee hasn't had the benefit of. All um, right. Okay. Uh, that, that, that's a good suggestion. So why don't we jump ahead to, uh, actually, it's not even what's well, part of an item that's on the agenda, but um, so in item B on the agenda, we are covering the issue of the approval of budgets. As you recall, in June, July, August, we went through the process of evaluating the IOLTA uh, uh, grant applications and concluded or made decisions about which ones were eligible. And we approved 101 organizations. And the next step in the process is for the organizations to submit budgets. And that's usually a fairly pro forma process. Staff reviews the budgets and um, the committee approves them typically on staff's recommendation. And we only elevate uh, any budgets that, that have issues where the, the budgets may be out of compliance with our guidance for how money is to be spent. This year, we have a handful of issues. Most of them are pretty minor and staff is recommending that we approve, but there's one that um, um, it does probably require some discussion and that is the Silicon Valley organization that Andrew was just speaking about. So Erica, why don't we just jump to that one? If you could kind of give us some background on that. Sure. Um, so as Andrew already mentioned, uh, Law Foundation of Silicon Valley would like to use their IELTA funding for direct representation in juvenile dependency proceedings. Um, historically, that's not something that has been funded with IELTA or EAF funds. Um, and as he mentioned, the assumption is that that work is already funded through contracts through, um, you know, the Judicial Council and the federal funding. Um, so this is the first time, as far as I know, that this organization has asked for funding to be devoted to the direct representation um, in other instances. And this is something that came up in, in the memo for today in other instances, like with Dependency Advocacy Center, they use their funding for dependency related work, but something that is not specifically covered by uh, their contracts, their existing contracts. Um, and so when this proposal was put forward, um, there was discussion with the organization, but it was ultimately decided it needed to be elevated to the committee because um, as far as we know, that hasn't been um, a use uh, an approved use of the funds previously. Um, some questions that staff had, and maybe Andrew can answer these are, um, related to the use of the funds. So, um, you know, I, Andrew, it wasn't clear f uh, from the budget proposal what exactly the contract covers. Can you explain a little bit how the funding works and whether, for example, um, you know, the contract is billed on an hourly basis or is it a flat fee per case? Um, I think the committee could benefit from understanding how the IELTA funds would be going towards something that's not already funded. And just to be clear, Erica, when you say the contract, you mean the contract we have with the Judicial Council? Yeah, your existing funding sources for this work, but yes, specifically right. that. Sure, so the, the dependency representation of children and parents who are going through the child welfare court system uh, has been funded for several years through a state budget line item that is ultimately administered by the Judicial Council. And uh, approximately 20 counties, including Santa Clara, contracts directly with the Judicial Council, the other 38, the funding goes to the local court, and then the local court contracts with the provider to allocate the funding. The funding is, the funding for uh, us is just a straight uh, flat annual amount. The contract year is September 1st through August 31st, and we are told based on the state budget allocation as well as the application of a specific formula that the Judicial Council developed to determine each county's estimated need that we will then be told we're getting X amount of dollars every year. And then that money, is, we invoice for that money and it's allocated equally over the course of 12 months. So we don't necessarily bill per case, we don't bill per hour. It's just a total allotment that the Judicial Council allocates to us and then we spend as we see fit to cover our payroll expenses as well as uh, associated other expenses. The formula that I alluded to that determines each county's estimated need, based on the fact that the state budget only funds about 67% of the state's estimated need, that means each county through the state is only getting 67% of the funding that the Judicial Council has determined is necessary to provide this service. I briefly alluded to the invocation of the ability for Dependency Council providers to also tap into federal funding to support this program. 
That is the Title IV-E program, which typically funds county child welfare services across, or state and county child welfare services across the country. For the first time, the, the uh, federal government announced that those, uh, those monies can be claimed by dependency council providers as well. Fiscal year 20 was the first year where we were able to access that money. We're still in the process of determining what those allocations will be, but we do know that based on initial projections, the combination of the state funding and the federal funding is still going to leave us significantly short of the entire expense that we have associated with this program. Can I, um, uh, my name is Brady Dewar. I'm an um, assistant general counsel at the bar. I wanted to ask you about your uh, contract with the judicial council. What, so you get a set amount of funding, but what are you required to do? Are you required to take every case that comes into the door? Are you? Yes, so through, so through that program, we are required to accept for a court appointment every child who is petitioned in Santa Clara County as an alleged victim of abuse or neglect. The only case is that we decline appointment is if we have a conflict of interest. So we are currently representing approximately 90% of the children who are before the Santa Clara County Juvenile Dependency Court. And our full scope of representation includes appearances at court proceedings, uh, addressing other needs of our clients as they come up concerning their safety, their health, and their well-being, addressing school-related issues, which are part of the Welfare and Institutions Code obligation of Children's Council, as well as implementing an interdisciplinary practice where we employ attorneys and social workers to work together in order for us to be able to make appropriate determinations as to what's in the best interest of our clients. I see. But, but I guess you, you sort of see what our concern is, that, that you have a contract that says you're being paid X amount and you have to do this work. So that should cover the work. Or, and if it doesn't, that's sort of a, a matter, um, given that the, that the uh, state has the responsibility for, um, for providing this representation, um, it, 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 it seems that the source of funding should be from the state. If, if they're not providing you enough to, to do what you have to do uh, to give these uh, people the right, the right that they have, um, it, it, it seems that the answer is to, to, to get that money from the state rather than from this other source, which is intended for um, free civil legal services for the indigent that aren't funded elsewhere. Right. And the-, the oh, Actually, Brady, can I, can, I, can, I, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, are, are, these, are you screening for indigency? Are, are all the, the monies being devoted to uh, to people who meet the indigency requirements? So our belief is that by nature of us accepting appointment for children, uh, specifically children who all data shows are typically in a lower socioeconomic class, that by nature they meet the definition of indigency. Can, can I just clarify that point um, of just for the committee in terms of our requirements? Um, we, we have required other agencies that provide um, juvenile dependency work, um, such as uh, 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 Preeti's organizations on the line as well. That's a newer organization um, to, to require screening. So um, a, a juvenile dependency isn't presumptively qualifying for our purposes, just, just okay. to make that clarifying point. It, All right. well, it, wasn't, wasn't there some issue about whether the, the rep, you were representing the parent or the child? If, if you're representing the parent, then you have to test them, but the child, I thought, could be because the child doesn't have assets. Well, you, you can make that argument, but that would be uh, for the committee to review, but there's not a presumption of a gotcha. juvenile dependency that that's indigency. Okay. I, I guess what, what, I'm, what I'm wondering about is um, if, if they're providing services to folks that qualify as indigent, if the services are civil legal services, um, what is our basis for is there anything in the in the in the statute or the state bar regulations or written down in the practice of the of the commission that says we can't fund this? Well, Eric, so I mean, this sort of gets at um, I mean, the, the the short answer to that is is no. And this came up actually when we were talking to um, Dependency Advocacy Center for the last um, last year, and um, it was sort of, it was more a policy concern, and they addressed it by saying, no, look, we're going to be using your funds to provide these additional services that aren't covered by the contract. Um, you know, 6210 makes clear that the purpose of the IALTA statute is to, um, is to provide for free legal services, free civil legal services that aren't funded elsewhere, 
um, and um, to improve the a bit availability and quality of free legal services for the indigent. However, there's no um, rule or guideline um, um, or statutory prohibition that would directly apply to this. Um, this, this though, um, definitely raises the question of, of whether they should be because um, again, the purpose of the statute, um, and, and this is something for the rules committee, is to provide funding where there's not already funding. And I think that, you know, the, the, the issue that was raised last year um, um, with DAC in which they addressed <laughs> services was, okay, every, um, dependency, is every dependency provider in the state gonna now be coming to us for money when they already have money? And I think, you know, before deciding whether that's a good idea to continue allowing that or not, we need to look at, you know, our, our, our dependency attorneys paid the same salaries as legal aid attorneys. I'm not, I'm not sure what the answer to that is, but, um, you know, we're hearing that they're not fully funded. Well, you know, are they operating at the same shoestring levels that our, our other legal aid organizations are? I'm not sure. So um, in answer to your question, no, we, we don't have a regulation um, um, currently, but, but the question was raised last year. And I, I, I think that this tees it up again um, is whether there should be. What the, can I can I also add to that, a little bit con context to that, um, Brady and Eric? Um, so th there's not an explicit rule or governing authority, um, though there is a strong implication that if you're getting funding from uh, from another source, that um, you, you can't use our money to fund the same thing because you're you're you'll be getting money twice for the same activities. So if if Silicon Valley is able to make um, an argument similar to how um, DAC was able to make an argument that you know though they're funded for uh, you know certain activities, we're funding something else. I think that would be the stronger argument. But absent that, I, I think you, the, the, I would implore the committee to to take a closer look. Um, though there's not explicit authority, um, you know that th 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 that's pretty clear in terms of like what the intention for our funding is. And yeah. and just to add a little bit more context to that. Um, the legislature has reached out to this office and I've spoken to them explicitly about dependency work and I've assured them that um, we, we do a close analysis at the budget review um, to confirm that there's not um, a, a double dipping of the funding. So I, I, as long as I think Silicon Valley can, can just show us that we're funding, um, we're, we would be funding activities that's not already funded by the Judicial Council, um, th then, then that may be appropriate this year. Um, but I, I, I guess I'm still struggling with, with what we would be funding versus what um, they are, would be obligated under the Judicial Council contract. Yeah. This is Corey, and, and um, yeah, I was just building on what Swana said. Historically, we have provided funding to organizations that do dependency services because they are doing something different with these funding. And I think that the statutory intent um, it's pretty clear that we are funding activities that are uncompensated, otherwise uncompensated. Um, and so if, if, if uh, attorneys are being compensated, even if it's not directly from the clients, that is a, a very different scenario than if they are just not being compensated at all absent funding. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but yes, I think, I think Dwan, um, said it well that that's that's what we've done as in the past and it it seems like um i i i i'm not sure that we should depart from that i think it also raises questions about how we distinguish between where our funding is going uh, versus where the state funding for dependency is going and and um how we how we're able to evaluate their budgeting and spending if those are um, basically being provided for the exact same services. But where does it say, this is a serious question, I'm not being rhetorical, I'm honestly just asking, where does it, a couple of you have alluded to the idea that the statute is directed to funding which is not otherwise compensated. Where where, where are you guys getting that? Where does it say that? Well, I mean, so the, so the, 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 the purpose comes from 6210. Um, Which is again talking about you know the the general purpose. So so you're not going to find a hard and fast rule there. Uh, the other thing, and and this is you know where where some more clear rules and regulations might come in, is 6224 um, specifically prohibits the use of um, funds for fee generating cases um, except pursuant to rules issued by the state bar. Um, 
and and there there we've released guidelines that oh you know if you get a court generated fee that's okay you can still spend mm -hmm. it as long as that money then goes toward providing more uh, free civil legal services, um, um, you know here an, an interpretation that that could be made of that statute is um, these are fee generating cases you are being paid by the government to do these cases um, so therefore you can't spend IOLTA funds but we don't have a specific rule implement um, promulgated yet that 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 addresses that. And that's um, right. I'm sorry. That's 6223, Eric. 6223. Uh, let me get my Westlaw to work. Uh, B. A. No. No funds allocated by the state bar pursuant to this article shall be used for any of the following purposes: um, the prov provision of legal assistance with respect to any fee generating case, except in accordance with guidelines, which shall be promulgated by the state bar. Right. So the idea is that it's fee generating even though the, the fee comes from the state. So what, if we wanted further information from Andrew, who I guess is about to leave us, what would we want to know? Eric, can, I also, in order can to... I also ask Andrew an additional question? Eric, may I? Yeah, sure. Um, Andrew, um, you know, you, you can tell this is this is kind of a, a difficult decision for the committee and staff to make a recommendation. I know that your your organization previously had never um, used IOLTA or EF to fund dependency work. Would it be a hardship for you to just find other activities to fund that's more clearly qualifying, so that we don't need to tackle this issue this year? So I'm when just asking that bluntly, yeah. So so I I haven't been directly involved in the conversations with staff uh, that my director of development has, and my understanding is that. Uh, the essence of your question has already come up and I do think it is a possibility for us. Okay. I think another possibility listening to the conversation about the distinction between dependency advocacy center and our application is mm -hmm. that if we did want to push forward with something within the scope of juvenile dependency, mm -hmm. we might be able to modify it to mm -hmm. have it cover things that aren't traditional legal services are covered by the state. So that is definitely feedback I intend to take back to my team to see what we wanna do. Yeah, I mean, that, that honestly would be uh, both easier on your end and easier on our end. Um, but but that's, that's, that's not to say that you couldn't pursue, I wanna make it very clear. That's not to say that you are not um, allowed or prohibited from pursuing this path of, of argument and, and trying to budget this, but we would need to do obviously more investigation and, 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 and you might not have a determination um, at this juncture. Yeah, I understand. And, and what I've been hearing of the conversations that have been taking place is very much in line with that. And we're, we're very appreciative of the ability to continue to have these conversations and for the time given today. So we, we will take a hard look. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Andrew. And <clears throat> it may be that when we come around to voting that what we'll wanna do is put a pin on this organization maybe not approve the budget at the moment, pending further information from the organization. But let's, let's, let's hold that for a minute. So Erica, let's go back to the agenda and maybe you could give us the update on the CHOC and the NLS financial statement submissions. But Eric, before we do that, um, really quick, you know, because this issue's come up before and I'm, I'm following Brady's um, argument structure, it seems pretty clear from the language actually um, I don't, I'm not, I don't see the, the ambiguity in this instance as I did in the, in the former, but um, definitely something for, for the rules committee. But in this instance, I just want to, I want to weigh in and say that everything Brady is actually highlighting is pretty clear um, that this organization would want to um, take those rules and uh, potentially pivot. I think that's what they've indicated they're going to try to do. Uh, Erica, do you want to want to proceed? Um, so I have a PowerPoint. I guess I'll just share that. And we can go through the, the rest. Does that include the NLS and chalk and yeah. interest statements? Yeah. Okay. So. So with NLS and CHOC, if you all recall, um, they were two organizations that re requested budget. Um, their audit extensions, uh, they were unable to 
comply with the original extension deadline of August 1st, um, but because the committee and the commission needed to make a decision on um, finding applications eligible, uh, what was decided was that they were tentatively approved um, their applications pending receipt of their final financial review or audit. Um, they were given an extension until August 31st, and if they couldn't meet the August 31st deadline, it required um, follow-up with the chair of the commission. So uh, Chalk was able to submit their financial review by the deadline, and staff reviewed that and had no concerns about it. Um, and so they, their budget, um, their tentative allocation was released, and they completed a budget proposal. And then um, NLS was unable to um, submit the final audit by August 31st. They did submit their draft numbers prior to the deadline um, and assured staff that those numbers were going to match their final audit. Um, they were granted a further extension to the end of September um, and submitted their final audit on September 29th. And um, it did indeed match um, what they had submitted previously. So. Um, both of those uh, applications move forward and they submitted their, their budget proposals. So. Okay, thank you. Do you wanna jump into the- Yeah, let, let's, yeah, we don't, we don't need to vote on that, right? That's just a no, reporting. It's item. just an update that they- okay. um, Yeah, why don't you proceed to talk about the budget issues? Sure. Um, so, as the memo you all received highlighted, there were a few budget-related issues that, um, that came up with the budget proposals uh, related to real property purchases, um, deviations from the recommended uh, allocations um, within the budget, and then possibly non-qualifying activities and late budget proposals. So, um, For those who weren't on the committee last year, um, real property purchases were uh, were increased in volume because of the increase in funding uh, for 2020. There was a significant increase in funding and many programs uh, decided to um, attribute some of their funding to make uh, real property purchases or, or capital additions in their budget. Um, and the real property purchase guidelines control those uh, essentially saying that anything in excess of $5,000 or 5% 5 of the grant award, whichever is lower needs to be uh, reviewed and approved by the committee. Um, this year, we only received one proposal um, that was from Neighborhood Legal Services requesting to use $25,000 of their IELTA funding to uh, complete some construction and improvements in their, their office. Um, they, <clears throat> excuse me, I, the memo, uh, there was a mistake in the memo saying that this is a continuation from last year. What happened last year was that they requested $200,000 to make uh, construction and improvements in their office, but ultimately revise their budget um, in response to COVID-19. Uh, they needed to attribute more of the funding to things like computers and um, you know, remote work systems. And so uh, this is a renewed request, but not a continuation. Um, and it's a much lower amount than what they requested last year. So um, in light of their need to make those uh, improvements in their office, staff was recommending approval of this, um, of this request. So um, do you wanna take these requests individually or do you wanna just go through the whole list of potential deviations and take them collectively? Um, I can just go through the list unless- um, Yeah, I think else. you should. Would prefer okay. to... Go ahead. So then the next issue that came up were deviations from recommended allocations. So in the budget proposal instructions, uh, programs are told that um, the recommendation is to allocate about 75% or more of their expenses to program expenses and 25% or less to administrative expenses. Um, it's the same distribution for personnel expenses versus non-personnel expenses. Um, it's not to say that programs cannot deviate from that, but anything that does deviate from that breakdown requires committee review. Um, so we had two instances this year where that occurred. Uh, one was with Legal Aid Society of San Bernardino. Um, they have a new case management system uh, and it brought their program expenses down to 73%. Um, in light of the need uh, to update their systems and also operate remotely, they 
um, had an explanation as to how this is going to improve their operations and staff felt that that was a reasonable deviation and is recommending approval on that. And then uh, neighborhood legal services deviated from their personnel versus non-personnel expenses. They had 65% um, of their budget allocated for personnel expenses and 35% for non-personnel. Um, and part of that was impacted by the office improvements we just talked about, and then uh, additional expenses for program and admin memberships and things like bar dues and contract services such as um, translators or interpreters and uh, trainers for their staff. And staff is also recommending approval of that deviation. And then the final thing has to do with salaries versus benefits. Um, if more than 40% of the personnel expenses are devoted to benefits that's elevated for committee review. Um, mental health advocacy services had more than 40% um, going towards their attorney's benefits in their EAF budget. Um, the reasoning for that is because they are able to bring on an Equal Justice Works Fellow this coming year. Um, and the way that those fellowships are funded, all of the funding from the outside funder has to go to salaries, um, but none of it can go to benefits. And so um, mental health advocacy services found themselves in the position of needing to make up the difference, but it made it a disrep disproportionate amount um, going to benefits. But um, given that explanation, again, staff recommends uh, approving that deviation. And then there were um, issues about possible non-qualifying activities or uses of grant funds. Um, one was from Dependency Advocacy Center, uh, attributing their funding to funding a social worker related to their juvenile dependency work and a supervising attorney. Um, they have a holistic interdisciplinary model um, and explained how the social worker fits into um, achieving better legal outcomes and um, moving their case forward. And this is something that has come up in the past. Um, it's a question of whether you know, the, the social work component fits under the umbrella of civil legal services. And that's uh, something that the rules committee is working on, but as it comes up on a case by case basis, um, in this instance, it was approved by the committee last year uh, for the same use. And so uh, staff is recommending that the committee approve um, that budget as well. And then I know we've um, already talked about it quite a bit, um, but Law Foundation of Silicon Valley is requesting to use their IELTA funding for direct representation in, in juvenile dependency. Um, and um, yeah, uh, we don't have a recommendation on this one. Um, as I think has already become clear from the conversation, there are um, arguments on both sides and so stuff wanted to present it to the committee, but doesn't necessarily have a recommendation, except to say that um, depending on the outcome of this conversation and potentially needing more information from the organization that uh, the committee is recommended to defer voting on their budget and uh, to revisit this at the next meeting on November 13th um, so that there's more opportunity for staff to be able to follow up um, and gather more information that might be useful to uh, the committee's decision. And then as noted in the memo, there were a few late budget proposals. All of them were received within an hour of the deadline. Um, they were due at 5 p.m. on September 21st. So um, given that it was within a short window of the deadline, um, staff is bringing it to the committee's attention, but is, is recommending that um, these budget proposals be accepted. And then just one, uh, item for the committee's attention, just an FYI that one organization has withdrawn their um, application, which was previously approved, but they're not pursuing um, the funding this year. And that was Heart LA. And they had um, a little over $11,000 total uh, in their grant award. And so because they're uh, not going to be receiving that funding this year, it's going to be, be rolled into next year's funding and will be redistributed at that time. Um, so just a, a recap of the recommendations, um, 
staff's recommending that the committee approve the real property purchase from neighborhood legal services, um, the three deviations from the recommended allocations, and uh, dependency advocacy centers use of IOLTA and EAF for, for social work and a supervising attorney for the social worker. Um, to defer on the foundation of Silicon Valley um, so that we'll have more opportunity to get you more information at the next meeting. And then uh, to recommend approval of all remaining budgets um, with the exception that uh, Silicon Valley be removed from that list at the moment um, until the next meeting. So if we were to adopt <clears throat> this recommendation, the bottom line is, it is the bottom line that we would be approving budgets for 99 out of 100 organizations and deferring one. Is yep. that right? Okay. You had another page, I think, on your slide. I'm sorry, I cut oh, you that's, off. Oh, it's fine. It's just about next steps, which we can maybe get to after um, finishing this discussion. Uh, I don't want this comment to be out of turn, but um, I'm not sure if you guys have seen Selena's comment in the chat and I don't know if it's relevant um, or we've already passed it. I just don't, I wanted to make sure that uh, she was uh, seeing. Why don't you share that? Selena, do you want to share your comment? I didn't see it. Oh, sure, sure. This is just a quick comment related to social workers. I know that um, it's flagged for a later discussion by the rules committee, but since the trust fund is, is briefly talking about social workers today, I wanted to let you know that in 2010, we had done a report on the use of social workers in civil legal aid in California. And um, we had not updated it since 2010, but right now when Justice and LAC are partnering on a, a little bit of a survey of how our community is using social workers and incorporating them into their legal practice. And when we sent the survey out, I immediately got responses from several um, executive directors saying that their organizations were discussing the same issue. They wanted to hire social workers and were trying to find out how other organizations incorporated social workers. So. I think this is just a very, very ripe issue because organizations want to provide more wraparound services. And so how you include them in legal services or not, I think is, is really important discussion. Yeah, I agree. That is, that is under discussion in the rules committee as well. And we understand that the ABA is undergoing a revision of its definition of legal services to encompass uh, a broader set of things, I, I think possibly things like social workers and other wraparound services as well. And the rules committee is trying to stay abreast of that and, and to at least consider what they're doing. Thanks, Selena. I think so. Yeah, any, any, yeah, any questions uh, or discussion about the report from Erica? Thanks, Erica, for that report. I think Sarah wants to jump in. Thank you. Um, thank you for the report and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my question is around um, neighborhood legal services. And so for the funding that would be provided for the real property improvements, what happens if that 25,000 is not provided for that purpose? Um, they would need to reallocate it to other parts of their budget. Uh, the funding doesn't necessarily get lost. It's just they would have to revise the budget to incorporate it into other um, parts of their operations or attribute it to personnel. Would we be? Would we know that, Erica? How would we know that? Um, I mean, if it's not approved, we would come back to neighbor, neighborhood legal services and let them know that they need to revise the budget. And then after they resubmit it, staff would review it to. No, but no. I think Zahir is asking, if I understand the question, what if we approve the budget but they don't spend the money? Is that, is that your question? Uh, okay. Prove the budget and they don't spend the money as they said they're going to spend it? Well, that would be like a, a secondary piece. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the first piece is just like what happens if they if it's not allocated. Um, but then um, I think it's it's also helpful to know what happens if they if they don't spend it. Um, I guess because on this particular um, piece, uh, you know, there are organizations who uh, I don't know if they're currently using their offices right now um, mm -hmm. to receive clients. Um, and I would be curious about that because organizations that are, some of them are doing capital improvements and it makes a lot of sense because they're using their offices and people are still coming into them. Um, mm -hmm. For organizations that are not currently using their offices, 
there are lots of nonprofits that are rethinking even what kind of office space they need kind of going forward into the future. Some have abandoned the leases all together um, and some are just reevaluating. And so given the time of constraint, I'm just um, curious in terms of the allocation of this funding for lease improvements for a space if it's not actually going to be utilized within the next year. Yeah, and unfortunately that's not um, a question I can answer right now because I didn't review that particular budget. I would need to follow up either with staff or directly with neighborhood legal services to get more information about specifically, you know, in this moment or in the coming months, what they're using their office space for, or if this is just anticipated for, you know, future use, maybe next year. Um, so I, I can definitely find out. And if that's something that is consequential to your decision, that's something I can um, you know, again, follow up with them before the next meeting. Um, if the this is them. Bob, this is Bob. I wanted to butt in and say, I can take a somewhat different approach that if they're not using their offices or not using them much, this might be a good time to modernize, upgrade the office because you can do it faster without work. having to work nights when there's overtime or weekends when there's overtime. Mm -hmm. Um, and you have less to worry about, let's say, the staff and the clients having to you know, wade through dust on the floor or paint smell or, or whatever. I know cities are now going through things like street repaving and repair more quickly mm -hmm. because there's fewer cars on the road. So the idea of using this now when an office is semi-vacant can be prudent in terms of cost effectiveness, making it better when we can actually go back to an office or make the office more easily subleasable if they don't need that space in a future time frame. So if I could just um, weigh in on that, and then I think there was the other part of the question that um, Eric also helped to tee up in terms of like what happens um, in the situation if they don't make these improvements. I, I think that there's a different calculation for um, organizations where they own the space. This sounds like this is a lease improvement um, for space that they don't own. Is that right? That's my understanding. Um, and so there's, with a lease improvement, um, there's a matter of how long the lease is. What does that mean for depreciation? Um, and then in terms of subleasing it, there are going to be, if you're subleasing to another tenant, then those tenants might have a different configuration that they would like to see. So the conversation around a lease versus real property that's owned, um, there may be very prudent reasons in terms of real property that's owned. I think there's a slightly different calculation when you're talking about a temporary facility that you're leasing. Um, but to the earlier question in terms of what happens if they don't spend the funds, it sounds like last time they didn't spend the funding Mm -hmm. and they were able to reallocate it, is yeah. that the understanding of what would happen this time? Yes, um, if it became apparent that um, they weren't going to be able to use the funding in the way they intended, um, we encourage programs to let us know as soon as possible that they require a budget revision and we release the forms to them and review them as they come in. Um, and they did in fact do that this year. Um, if there was some sort of discrepancy in their reporting versus what they had actually budgeted, that's something we would follow up with them on. But as far as I know, we haven't had an issue of a, a program not notifying us of the need for the budget revision. Um, and if it was something that wasn't notified and for whatever reason wasn't caught in reporting, that's also something that we would be looking at in terms of our monitoring visits to make sure that they're uh, complying with the grant. Thanks, Erica. Thanks, Zahira. Are there any other any other discussion items, questions? Uh, should we proceed to vote? I mean, we could do this a couple of ways. We could take up the staff's recommendation in total, or we could take the budget deviations one by one. Um, I see the staff recommendations once again uh, on the screen. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. And then if you don't mind, Erica, rereading them for all the people that are on the phone. Um, yeah, no problem. 
Yeah, we, we did, but we can, we can do that again. Sure. Um, so the, the staff recommendations are to approve the real property purchase or the capital additions that Neighborhood Legal Services uh, is requesting to make with their IULTA funds to approve the deviations from the recommended program admin or personnel allocations um, in the instance of Legal Aid Society of San Bernardino purchasing a new case management system, neighborhood legal services making their capital additions as well as uh, funding contract services and membership dues. Um, and then the, uh, the benefits in excess of 40% of salaries for mental health advocacy services given um, the way they need to make up the difference in funding for their Equal Justice Works Fellow. Um, and finally, to approve the use of IL-10 EAF funds by Dependency Ad Advocacy Center to fund a social work, a staff social worker and a supervisor um, for their dependency work. And then there's a recommendation to defer on making a decision about Law Foundation of Silicon Valley's budget um, so that we can provide you with more information at the next meeting. And um, finally, to recommend to the commission to approve all remaining budgets as reflected in the attachment to the memo that you all received, but with the one modification to remove Law Foundation of Silicon Valley at the moment. So, so that's Eric, the yeah. yeah. To answer your question of whether we should take it as one lump or subdivide it, with uh, Zahira's question, I'm wondering if. Um, from the answers that she's received, if she's comfortable with going forward as one lump sum, or should we subdivide and take out the neighborhood um, neighborhood legal services? Um, I think that's well, a question to use, Zahira. Thank you. Um, I I think that there's um, for neighborhood legal services. It sounds as if we we have some of the information, but not all of it with respect to pieces like um, the, the use of the property. And so I, I, would, I would prefer to be able to separate that one out um, if possible. Well, so, could, we, could, we make a, could we make a motion to approve the staff's recommendation with one deviation? And that is that we put NLS uh, aside along with um, the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley, but, but move to approve the rest of the recommendation recommendations yeah i think maybe having yeah separate motions on uh, so just having one motion to approve and leave nls out of it and then having one motion to defer on those two if that's what the committee wants to do and then the final one for the recommendation to the commission i guess i guess my motion would be to approve the staff's recommendation with one modification, and that is to um, to defer on um, on the NLS budget as well. So we would be deferring under my motion. We would be approving the staff's recommendation to approve all budgets with ex with, with the exception of two NLS and Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. But I just want to go back to what I was just, um, speaking to Eric. I'm not sure if the rest of the commission is in alignment with deferring on NLS based on then what Bob Planthold said. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure that we separate that out in terms of uh, <clears throat> recommendations and how we vote on it. Well, all right, do, do, we, do we want to take, I mean. Can I yeah, ask go ahead. Sorry. Um, staff, sorry, this is Corey. Is, is, can I ask staff, um, is there, would, would deferring on NLS cause any um, logistical problems any different than Law Foundation of Silicon Valley? Not that I'm aware of. Eric, I can, I can add a little context to that. We have to have, um, it, the, the deferral uh, means that we, uh, we need to have quorum on November 13th before the commission meeting, because if you, we don't have quorum at the committee level, we move into the commission meeting that afternoon, and if you and if the commission does not approve budgets, we will not be able to issue checks on time for January distribution. That's my only caveat that that it won't delay as long as we have quorum on November 13th at the committee level. And we would need okay. quorum that day anyway, regardless mm -hmm. of these issues, because at the next meeting we're going to be dealing with um, 
budget revisions and carryovers. So quorum is seven people. <clears throat> yeah. seven commissioners. Okay, so we need quorum on November 13th uh, <clears throat> because we need to get all the budgets approved by committee so that we can make a recommendation to the commission. That's correct, Eric. On November 13th. So it's very, very important okay. we have quorum to, to move it forward. If not, we will, we will have 200 checks delayed in January. So I don't want to underscore the importance of that to get the funding out for programs on time this year. Okay, well, I mean, again, I... Um, I, I guess I'm inclined to move if nobody wants to second it, it won't be seconded, but I'm inclined to approve the staff's recommendations with, in other words, to approve all submitted budgets with two exceptions, one NLS and the second, the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. And those so will be deferred I'll second. And to information. I think, um, Eric, the those deviations um, and the real property purchases, that's something that needs to be approved before just approving the budget proposal in general. So we need, okay, all right, well then. You should be separate. Uh, if you could put your, put the proposal up again so we can, I can see it. Um, I can, I just, um, for whatever reason, it's not letting me share the screen and look at the vote tally at the same time. So um, I can share the screen, but then I won't be able to um, keep track of the votes. So. Okay. So um, without seeing the screen, I'll take a shot at it. I guess I would move that we approve the deviations that are, that the staff recommends that we approve with the exception of NLS and Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. Second. Bob Plantle seconds. Thanks, Bob. And so just, just for clarification, Eric, are we deferring NLS or are yes, we just, yes, are we just putting it on a side for right now and then we'll right after this motion and roll call vote, we'll attack NLS? Uh, we're deferring. Okay. Pending further information. And I just want to make sure that, that, that everybody else is okay with that. And it seems like Bob is because he just seconded it. Yeah, deferring, deferring till the next meeting, That's right? True. Yeah. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the motion is to approve the deviations based on staff's recommendation with the exception of NLS, which will be deferred until the next meeting. So. And Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. Okay, okay. I'll take roll. Um, Iskin? Yes. <clears throat> McCloggy? Yes. Uh, Bales Fightmaster? Uh, yes, on the every, yeah, the uh, Law Foundation, I need to um, abstain from okay. the other, yes. Yeah. Uh, Bennett? Yes. Connolly? Yeah. Ravos? Yes, question of can, 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 can Louise abstain on one portion and vote on the other portion? Sorry. Is it is it two motions or just one and she's abstaining from something and voting on something? Is that appropriate? It's one motion. You may be right. Let's let's go on and count the votes and see if we have enough without Louise's. Yes, for me. Delfino? Yes. Uh, Friedman? Yes. Man? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Myers? Planhold? Yes. Savage? Savage? Thank you. Um, it would pass regardless, so. Okay. Okay, that's good. Um, so we also need to uh, approve the, the balance of the budget. Question, Eric, budget. what is what is the vote? What is the vote count? Erica, you want to give us the vote count? Yeah. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
10, not including Louise, it's 10, okay. including her, it's 11 with her abstention regarding Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. But, and there were no no's, the, there was only the abstention regarding um, that one piece. So I think Herman's technically right. We probably just have 10 votes for and one abstention. Uh, this is Bob. I disagree for the record. We previously would get these lists of agencies seeking funding where we would check off if we were in recusal for some sort of conflict. Having done that and what um, Louise did orally was the same thing. Having done that, then one could vote yes or no on the package because one had declared the recusal. That's what she did. So it's not that her vote shouldn't be counted. Uh, she acted appropriately. It's just orally rather than checking off a box on a piece of paper uh, that indicated a recusal. I did yeah. also. Re I also did recuse on that agency. You know, on that list of that we were asked to complete earlier. So, yes, so maybe it was, okay. so maybe it would be eleven votes for. Um, um, one aspect of the motion and 10 for all except for the uh, organization that you have stained on. I don't know, you may be right, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I'll that's defer to how we've handled it. Um, for example, when you vote on the whole list for applications, um, members have noted where they need to recuse themselves, but it didn't require necessarily going through every single uh, program on the list individually. Okay. I'll defer to you guys. In any event, the motion passes. Do we also need to um, approve the remaining, the budgets for the remaining organizations? Yes. Um, so the recommendation would be to recommend, recommend to the commission approval of all remaining budgets with the exception of NLS and Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. Pending further information. So, have, have, just so, just so I'm clear, have we essentially approved the budgets for the organizations with deviations that we just voted on? You've approved the deviation, and now it enables you to recommend approval okay. of the budget. <laughs> All right. yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, um, since I seem to be butchering motions left and right today, let me let me move on to my next mistake. So, I will. Um, move that we approve the budgets for all organizations um, listed in the memo with the exception of um, NLS and Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. Okay. Second. Sorry, was that Luis? Or... That was Luis. Yes. Okay, great. So I'll take one. Um, Iskin? Yes. O'Clocky? Yes. Bell's Fight Master? Yes. Bennett? Yes. Connolly? Uh, I need to recuse slash abstain from community legal services of East Palo Alto, but otherwise, yes. Uh, DeBose? Yes. Delfino? Yes. Friedman? Yes, with abstentions for CRLA, CRLAF, and WorkSafe. Uh, Ma'am? Yes, um, and abstaining for uh, disability rights. I'm not sure which one, but maybe disability rights, California. Number 27. Uh, Meeker? Uh, yes, abstaining from Public Law Center. Myers? Planhold? Yes, except for Bay Legal. And Savage? Uh, yes, but abstaining um, for mental health advocacy services. Uh, Erica, you should note me as abstaining for Bay Sedic as well. I neglected like to say that. So that motion passes as well. 
Okay, great. Um, I don't know if um, anyone on the committee has specific questions um, that we haven't already covered that you want me to follow up with Neighborhood Legal Services or Law Foundation of Silicon Valley for the next meeting. Um, here I've noted your, your questions, um, so I will ask them those. So I, I, have, I, have a, I have a just question about where we landed on Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. Are we saying that if, if they come back and propose a budget that either allocates nothing to the juvenile dependency work or allocates money specifically to pieces of the juvenile dependency work that are not covered by their judicial counsel contract, for example, social workers or some other discrete piece of that that's not covered by the contract, that if they do either of those things, we would be okay? Is that, is that kind of what I was hearing from the discussion? I just sort of throw that out to the, to the group for comment. Well, in those cases, I think that they would um, have shown eligibility for funding if I think um, <clears throat> It sounded like um, the person who was present is planning to go back and, and see whether whether that money could be requested in a form that makes it easier to uh, reach a decision. Okay. Uh, Eric, I've got a question. Exactly what are we asking NLS to give us to consider next time? We're going to ask them for more information regarding um, these capital additions, like what are they using their office space for now? What are they envisioning using it for um, after they make those improvements? Is this really, you know, an appropriate use of their funds? How long is um, their lease? You know, is it a short term lease or do they have a long term one? Um, I think Sahara mentioned questions about how that would impact their depreciation. Um, so just getting more specifics about not just what it's for, but how it's going to um, be used and what that means long-term for the organization. Okay. Uh, but in terms of uh, what questions we're seeking from our good friends in Silicon Valley, I think Brady, if you're still on, if you could weigh in, um, that would be really helpful. You mean now or, or once we once we get their response and see whether it's sufficient? Well, hopefully before so that we when we get to the November meeting, we can make a, a determination. I still don't understand understand. I mean, we've asked them so you, you're asking for my analysis to be shared with you in advance once we get there. Once we no, get. no. I mean, right now, as we're, we're looking at going back to them with specifics that Erica is going to ask to bring back to the, the subcommittee, you had uh, you had highlighted two, three statutes or two, three. Well, well sure. I mean, it, it's 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 clear that if they can make the changes that we've requested and that we've accepted in the past from, you know, DAC, then, then they'd be fine. Um, the question is, if they don't do so, are we going to um, interpret you know, how do we interpret what's a, what's a fee generating case? Um, and I'll read you one more piece of the statute. Let me pull it up. And, and Bonashi, I guess while Brady's pulling it up, um, we, we might need not to, we might not need to get to the fee generating question because it's a very complicated analysis. It seemed like they were amenable to working with staff to just um, budget something that was more clearly qualifying, either a social worker work or work that's clearly not funded by the judicial council. And if that's the course of action, then it will probably be a non-issue um, and it will be report back in, in November, which is probably, probably what we prefer. And it sounded like they were open to that. Right. I mean, so fee generating the case, um, and this is 6213E, means the case or matter that if undertaken on behalf of an indigent person by an attorney in private practice, reasonably may be expected to result in the payment of a fee for legal services uh, from an award to a client from public funds or from the opposing party. So um, my understanding is that if a, a private attorney did take on one of these cases, they would, they would get compensation so that, that falls into that. Uh, a case shall not be considered fee generating if adequate representation is unavailable and any of the following circumstances exist. Um, 
the recipient has determined that a, a free referral is not possible because of any of the following reasons. Um, the case has been rejected by a local lawyer referral service. Neither the referral service nor the attorney will consider the case without payment of a consultation fee. The case of the type that the attorneys in private practice in the area ordinarily do not accept or do not accept without prepayment of a fee or emergency circumstances compel immediate action. Now, clearly this, this wasn't written with this um, particular practice area in mind, um, but you know, as you work through it, I mean, it's 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 clear that you know that this is a policy question that we need to to decide because there's there's definitely wiggle room on 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 either side. You're saying that the way we've interpreted that statute is that if an activity generates fees from the state or for the county, it's considered fee generating for that purpose. Well, I don't think we've ever. I don't think the. I don't, Don, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think, I think we've sort of avoided. Um, well, we, we actually have interpreted it because we funded um, a, a DAC that, that this is not fee generating, but like Brady is saying, this is um, a, an area that's very ambiguous for us. And it, it, it should, we should deal with the codification because it's, it's a very deep analysis and very complicated. It, it's similar to pass through and that the, it's um, opening mm -hmm. up a whole and with mm -hmm. DAC, what we did is we sort of we the, the way we 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 rationalized it and looking at sort of the purposes was that we we said, hey, look, they're they're what they're doing, they're not getting fees for. It's sort of a different part of the case. Yeah, the but still, case. it's it's it, the, the the I, I if we if we, we we should not try to make policy around this because it, like again, it's going to be a very involved analysis. So. I'm, it seems like um, Silicon Valley was amenable to working with staff, so we don't have to address this now, and that would be addressed in codification. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I just I wanted to just make sure that um, because of mm -hmm. what was highlighted in terms of getting the checks out by January, that there yeah. was maybe anything else outstanding that might come to us on the 13th if, of November. So, and if they choose to pursue um, this, um, Brady, um, Erica, and I will put our brains together and uh, we'll come up with a course of action um, yeah. for, for you. And be, and and that that just you. Up, you know, here's what the statute says. Here's the argument that we, we could apply it and say no. Here's here's the argument, um, uh, you know, the, the opposing argument and uh, just make the, make the decision. Great, thank you guys. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, one thing, you. actually, one thing I, I would be curious is is what 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 from Andrew and um, what happens if they don't get additional funding because it sounds like they're contractually required yeah. to provide these services. So, uh, what happens if they don't get additional funding? Um, yeah, I'm curious you know? about that too. I, I think it was yeah, um, even from his response, I, I just couldn't get my head around what what judicial counsel is funding and what he's been funding. And I think that's been the struggle with um, getting information from them. So, so we, we will, we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll loop back. Um, yeah. and, and what is on, what is, you know, we're underfunded. What does that mean? Yeah. You're not, again, my understanding, and I, I think we have, that should have this in their application. I think mm -hmm. these attorneys get paid more than most legal aid attorneys. Um, so, you know, unfunded for them might underfunded for for these dependency organizations mm -hmm. might mean something different than um underfunded what are what are what are most of our legal aid providers would consider underfunded but well, we don't run around looking at budgets of organizations to say oh you're paying your entry-level attorneys seventy-five thousand, but everyone else in the community is paying them seventy-three thousand. we don't do stuff like that do we i mean no, but I'm saying this just this gets to the this gets to the policy reason of, of mm -hmm. why there's some distinction between um, you know organizations that are already being you know getting fees whatever that means um, for their work and organizations that aren't and and if these organizations are are getting money under a contract and and then coming to us and saying well the contract doesn't provide enough. Um, it, it it invites these questions that we haven't generally had to look at. Yeah. I, I can I'll just chime in quickly because my daughter worked at that um, worked there for about 10 years. That's why I'm recused from it. But there's a difference between who's representing the children, which is what the law foundation does, and who's representing the parents, which is an outside um, firm or firms. 
and the parent <clears throat> representation attorneys get paid a lot more than the children's attorneys who are in the foundation and other similar entities. You know what my list is? Um, well, this is an interesting discussion. Any other any other comments on that before we go to next steps? Erica, you want to? So let me let me just reinforce that it is important that we show up on November thirteenth. Mm -hmm. Critical, uh, Eric. Before you jump uh, to the next, there's another uh, comment in in the chat by Pamela Bennett. Just want to make sure everybody's <laughs> seeing her. I think I hit um, enter too soon because that <laughs> along with, I apologize, that belonged with uh, 4C. I had some questions about the allocation and calculation. Um, but in addition to that, I just had a quick question. When will we actually see um, the results from you know, this year's work that could or could not have been completed? Well, will, will we see that next year? the actual work that was provided to the clients and a real clear picture of how the funds were used, who would actually um, mm. were served. Will we see that next year from, from the, from the mm. organizations? Erica, do you want me to take that question? Um, if you want to. <laughs> um, so we, we have reporting requirements, uh, Pamela, um, that they're required to report to us. Mm -hmm. um, for I, There's not a specific IOLTA uh, a reporting requirement. We have them commit um, submit um, case summary reports on the number of cases closed, but the number of cases closed is across all funding sources. So it doesn't break down specifically to IOLTA. With EEF, uh, we do because we aggregate the, 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 those reports and we send it to Judicial Council and LAC and the, and the legislature um, to know um, what we've been doing with EEF. So there are reporting requirements um, we have main economic benefits that we um, collect that are outcomes based. Again, um, based on um, cases closed at the time the cases closed. Um, you know what was the benefit um, that was achieved for that client, client um, in the case. Um, we, we we don't have uh, in terms of you know there are a lot of cases that take uh, more than a year to close. Um, so so we couldn't give you kind of an outcome. Um, uh, 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 assessment of those cases, but um, we can aggregate the data. We do aggregate the data annually, um, and 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 you know uh, share it with um, uh, the legislature and so forth. We have a 2019 report that we publish on the impact. Uh, it's called the 2019 impact report that uh, we were we can send out um, to, to this committee to give you kind of a sense of um, what has been achieved nice. by our legal aid community. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Question: Is there a uh, uh, Don? Is there like an overall evaluation within that report looking at established goals and whether those goals and objectives were met by the organization based on what was requested in the RFP? Um, it's, it's, I think I know what you're getting at. And, and, and I, I think there's definitely room for improvements in terms of our data collection. A lot of um, the reporting requirements are quantitative in nature because it, it's just easier for us to aggregate and then report on that um, to our external stakeholders. Uh, we do have some um, narrative questions where we ask about, you know, what's worked, what hasn't worked, um, you know, why didn't something work? Um, so, so we have that, but I think um, haven't talked to you and kind of Jim uh, about evaluations that this definitely is an area that 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 can be um, uh, enhanced um, and and further developed. Um, and you know when the reboot committee was was around, um, you know they worked um, for many number of years on just the main and economic benefits um, piece. Um, and and Corey can can speak to that. She was on that committee for several years before we rolled out those outcome measures. Um, but but that it definitely is a work in progress. So I don't think it's quite at the the, the stage that um, you would like it to be. Um, but but it but with that said, we've gone a long way, and we do are able to aggregate really good da data um, to present out. And you will send us that report, right? Yes, we okay. will send you the the report. Yeah, the report. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Pamela, was there a second part to your question? I said, oh. I think I hit the inner key too, oh, okay. <laughs> but I had a question about the allocations uh, for each of the organizations, that's all. Oh, well, sure, I can, it? I can answer that yeah. now. Okay. Um, so the funding formula is based on the number of persons per county um, who are considered indigent. So be at, at or below 125% of the federal poverty level. 
So each county has a certain amount from the total amount available that's allocated to the county. And then the organizations that operate within that county receive funds based on a pro rata share so um, of their qualified expenditures. So you may have an organization that um, is smaller in size or has a lower percentage of qualified expenditures. And so that would lower their grant award comparatively with the other organizations providing services. Perfect. Thank you. Did everybody get to look at the C to the memo, which which spells out the allocation that, or I would just commend to everyone if you haven't seen it already, attachment C to Erica's memo, which actually spells out the dollar amount of allocations that are provisionally going to each of the each of the grantees. It's a good chart. I wish we had a handy dandy chart. I wish we had a chart like that that summarized sort of all funding streams and what everybody's getting. Place. We, we, we actually do, Eric. We have one like that for developed for 2019. It's just we haven't yeah. closed out all our grants for 2020, so we haven't put it together. But we do have oh, that. Great. Okay. And we can share that out for 2019 if you're curious. Yeah, that would be great. At least I'd like to see it. Yeah. And uh, Eric, and you want to go on to next steps? Well, oh, I have sorry. a little ahead, question, Jim. Eric. Uh, yeah, just for our discussion on November 13th on the Silicon Valley situation, if we could get an analysis from Brady. Because my understanding, the big problem here is they're, they're getting money from the state to represent these dependent children. Uh, and so therefore they're already being funded. How do we handle the situation for our LSC funded programs since they're already getting federal funds? Or can you make a distinction between those two different sources of fundings or that argument? I don't need to know the answer now, but I'd like to know it on the 13th when we discuss it in greater detail. Well uh, I mean, and Duan, you you can explain how it shows up in the um in the in the budgets, but but all of all of our grantees, every, all the work they do, they attribute to a funding source, so mm -hmm. they're not they're not double double counting. Yeah. Funds. This there's a contract for them to do X work um, for these dependency cases, and in addition to that funding, they're now saying they want funding from us. Yeah, we we require programs to have fund accounting. What that means is that. They have to um, attract their funding, uh, you know, their, their grants and their funding sources to the to the source of funding. So when we go on monitoring visit, our um, uh, our um, accountant um, does verify the check that there's no double dipping and and the, and the, it's all appropriately um, uh, tagged and, and 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 accounted for. So with LSC funded organizations, uh, you know, we traditionally never have an issue because LSC requirements are really strict about that too. You know, our audit, when we go out to a program, it's anywhere between one and two days, they go out for a whole week. So I would say traditionally, um, it, it hasn't really been an issue with LSC just because of the strict requirements that they have to um, abide by by LSC. But we also, uh, you know, we, 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 we uh, be rest assured that we, we, we have um, systems in place to verify that on, on monitoring visits. Just another example of how hard the staff has to work on, on all these budgets. Um, again, uh, take this opportunity to commend Erica and Duan and everyone else who's been working so hard to, to evaluate these budgets in a timely manner for and digest the issues for us. So thank you for doing all that. Great work. So Erica, do you want to uh, you want to talk about next steps? Sure. Um, so the committee's next meeting is November 13th, uh, immediately preceding the commission meeting. Um, what we'll be dealing with at that meeting is what came up today. So um, we'll bring you more information so you can vote on neighborhood legal services and law foundation of Silicon Valley. Um, also budget revisions and carryover requests from the 2020 budgets are due on November 2nd. And so um, we will be bringing anything that requires the committee's attention to that meeting. Um, as of yesterday, it looked like we had 17 requests for budget revision and or carryover, but I won't know, our staff won't know until they're all submitted whether it will require the committee to review because um, anything between 10 and 25% of a carryover or a revision is something that um, the Office of Access and Inclusion can approve. Um, so I'm not sure what percentage of those requests are going to exceed 25%, which will then require the committee's review. Um, I imagine some of them will, but um, won't be able to say at the moment exactly, exactly how many, but we will provide materials for 
the committee to evaluate those requests. And we, we already decided, at least as a policy matter, to look with favor this with increasing flexibility this year on carryover requests, even those exceeding the 25%, right? So we didn't pre-approve them, but we agreed as a policy matter to look with increasing liberality on such requests mm -hmm. in view of the pandemic. Yeah, and as well as the, the carryover period, typically organizations need to spend the funds that they carried over in the first two quarters of the following year. Um, but it, from what I recall, the uh, commission also indicated that a longer spend down period would, would likely be approved. Um, Okay. Um, anything else on your, you have a preview. So have you covered next steps? Yeah, for the next meeting, I um, initially thought we might have the um, list of meetings for 2021, but we're still working on that. So um, I'll have to do that at, at the next meeting. Any guess as to whether any of them are going to be in person? <laughs> <laughs> uh, not yet. We can hope. You can always hope. Uh, anything else, Erica, on your agenda? Uh, no, not for me. Any other comments from the commissioners or staff, public? All right. I'm sorry. Bob, you want to make your... Okay, go ahead. Sure. I'm sorry. Did we need to make a, 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 a determination on those that were late or did staff just handle that? And those that submit the applications later, yeah. staff manage that. Um, it's my understanding last year that that was brought to the committee's attention, but I don't recall the committee needing to vote on that. I don't know if to one. Okay. So I didn't list it as something as an item that required a vote. But yeah, I think I think it could be included in just your, your the earlier vote that you approved that by you know by way of your approval that you accepted that late. Pam, you want to take back your vote? <laughs> uh, um, I, I actually would would not approve the late ones. Um, and I know that we're being flexible, but we still have timelines. Um, so um, I would, yeah, for, for the late ones, I would say a no vote for that. Um, it's just just yeah just to note the no vote for the late ones um and um the social worker piece for dac based on that that should have been provided by a paralegal so those two things i'm i'm kind of not 100 percent on but everything else yes so weren't they only late by an hour but yeah but, but that that is that is that is true. Less than an hour. We are a deadline oriented society, and sometimes, in other instances, you know, as an example, with the personnel department for the city of LA, they give you when an exam opens for you to take a test for a promotion or otherwise, they give you a window with no grace period. So you have a window from Friday at eleven fifty nine p.m. to start your process till. A week later, 11.58, to get it completed, and there's no grace period. So I think um, just the fact that staff does so much work, your organizations, um, I think it needs to be timely. I think it needs to be timely. So that would be my thing, just to be timely. Even though we are we are where we are, we still have deadlines. We still have the obligations that need to be met, um, and they require deadlines. So that's just me. I, I think the difference here though, is that I'm, I understand that we want programs to be responsible, but mm -hmm. it would be a pretty par harsh penalty, not only to the program, but to their clients. Mm -hmm. If they are a few minutes late and then they're, they can't serve their clients mm -hmm. any further. So I think it's, um, important we recognize the ultimate beneficiaries of the fund. I have a question. Should we have a deadline or should we say our deadline is five o'clock? However, if you submit by 530, we'll, we'll accept it. Um, the current uh, way that that's handled is, you know, 
we tell programs we have a deadline of 5 p.m. If you submit later, you should submit as soon as possible. But as staff, we can't necessarily say that that's been accepted, that we need to bring it to your attention. Um, and what is what as soon as possible mean? I, I mean, so I believe there is a point where the program automatically pro shuts them out from um, there's like a grace period of a few hours. And then after that, they would have to request us to reopen it. And then um, if they submit it, then we just bring it to the committee and you make a decision about whether that timeline was reasonable. We don't, we cannot tell them, you know, this, there is nothing currently in terms of the rules that has an outlined um, way of dealing with late applications. That's something that's actually part of the codification process. So. I just, I just know when I was writing grants, when I was working, if, if the Fed said five o'clock Eastern time, mm -hmm. it needed to be there by five o'clock Eastern time. Otherwise, it was not accepted. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's why we bring this to the committee's attention and you can make a determination about what's reasonable and what's egregious. Um, but we cannot tell programs that we have a hard cutoff because there is no explicit rule about that. Um, we tell them what the deadline is and then it is at the committee's discretion whether to accept a late submission. Um, that's, and like I said, we encourage them to get in as soon as possible when something is late, both to ease the burden on staff and to ensure that you know it does seem more reasonable like submitting something within an hour of a deadline versus a week later. Um, that would probably make a difference, but. Uh. Eric, you have a, a number of people in queue on the chat, if you can see, starting with Selena on the matter. Yeah, I see Selena. that. I see that. So uh, we've got Selena and Dwan, and uh, Dwan's dropping off. Uh, so it's Selena and Kim and Zahira. So go ahead. Um, just a, a very brief comment as, as your liaison to legal aid community. Um, legal Services Trust Fund Commission and State Bar staff had, had historically had a grace period. And so if you wanted to have a firm deadline, it would at this point in time seem like it got you for these three programs that submitted less than one hour late. Because um, it really is a, ultimately to the benefit of the clients and having a gotcha to the programs doesn't hurt the programs, it hurts the clients that they would have been able to serve. And it also requires additional work for state bar staff if they had to reallocate and redo the formula um, based on their assumption that, that the commission would have been okay with a, a deadline. But Erica's point about really egregious late applications, I think is really well taken. I think the commission has really looked at those more seriously, but those that are still kind of end of the traditional business day of 6 p.m. is I think very different from those who submit two weeks late or even later. Thanks, Selena. Kim? Um, I want to echo um, Corey and Selena's comments in that um, ultimately it's the clients who are harmed. Um, we have, th this topic comes up almost every time the commission has to look at, you know, a few late applications. We've always the majority have felt we continue to look at these on a case-by-case -case basis. We keep a deadline. There's usually some reason that something is coming in late. Um, and with all due respect to you, Herman, I don't want to behave like the federal government. <laughs> I, I think that is not our role here. Our role is to make sure that programs can do their job of helping people who are really in need. So um, I think we should continue to operate we have, which I think is with integrity and looking on a case by case basis. I think that um, when we hear from programs as to uh, some lateness and a basis for it, um, I think we take that into consideration and continue to move forward as we have. I think overall with the number of programs we have, we don't have a lot of late uh, applications coming in. That's it for me. Yeah, thanks, Kim. Zahira? Um, thank you. And I think that this is um, such a helpful conversation to have. Um, I, I 
I do have um, some concerns with the, the lateness um, as was raised by others. Um, we are talking about organizations that provide legal services. Courts have hard and fast rules in terms of when things are submitted. Um, and it's the same sort of situation where if you don't get something on time, it hurts the client. And so I think that we're also talking about entities that have a, a good sense of what deadlines mean and the consequences to their clients if they don't meet those deadlines. Um, I also think that a lot of times when we're talking about governmental funding, there is a hard and fast rule in terms of when things need to be submitted. So I, I, I do question whether or not we're speaking about organizations that where they're not conscious of the fact that timelines are really relevant and they're really critical to being able to serve their clients. Um, here, we, we are in a time period where there are a lot of exceptions. And since things are being submitted online um, with complications with internet, there could be all sorts of reasons as to why there would be a delay that wouldn't otherwise be the case. But it sounds like Erica, in terms of what's being communicated out, if everyone has an understanding that this is the deadline and if you can't meet it, reach out to us and we'll be able to um, help you along the way. I think that that kind of provides some level of equity um, and an even playing field um, for, for others. But I, I do think it's a helpful to have the discussion and I think it's helpful to kind of continue to reconsider it um, based on where we are as a society and the availability of, of internet. Um, because I, I do think it speaks to the capacity of the program. Thank you. Yeah, great, great discussion. Um, Are there any looks, more? You know, yeah, it looks like Bob has his hand raised and Bonafshe has a comment. Okay. Just, so this is Bob. I, I, I like what Zahira was saying that we're in unusual times and who knows what's gonna happen. Like she said, possibility of internet problems, maybe a pipe burst and, you know, floods part of the um, executive director's laptop or system or their server. Any of that can happen. But also her idea of if an agency is running short on time and they've got some glitch or some problem, let us know. I think that could be worth discussing. But right now, we're starting to get into a policy development issue from side comments. This may be something that we want to ask um, to be an agenda item for a later meeting and uh, for staff to look at the possibility of a <clears throat> we're going to be late type warning or notice is desirable uh, to come from anybody who's suddenly stuck with a whoops glitch. Um, the idea of we're going to be late notice, I think, could be helpful. Let's not start to, as they say, develop a policy or, or, or go into this at length when it's almost an agenda item for the future. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Bob. I mean, at this point, it's just a general discussion. So I, I think we can, we're not going to develop policy today, but I think it's useful to have the discussion. So, uh, Bonashay, did you have a comment? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to put some context around this as well. You know, um, this is being recorded. We may have members of the public here, um, folks from the community that we are funding um, may come back to this. So I think it's really important for us to, obviously we're, we're sending a message, right? There's a, there's a, a message that's being um, articulated, which is let's work in partnership. The staff is inundated, you know, we on the commission, are serving time voluntarily. And so how can we balance this in a, in, a, in a way where everyone is being served? So I think that point needs to also be um, driven home that we're not trying to say, um, if you're gonna put it in at 501 and that's because you just got into a car accident that we're not going to take your, your application. We wouldn't do that, right? Um, or we had a, one of the groups who said that they had been quote unquote ransacked and so they needed additional time. So I think it's important um, to also state that this body is reasonable um, and that we will take all of the, the facts into account and you know do we really need additional facts for a few minutes of being late? Does that add more uh, work on the staff side to try to run after them to figure out what happened rather than just you know, 
allowing that reasonable tardiness. So I, I just want to want to put a few more um, pieces in play, but that really what I hear the commission saying here is, um, come on, work with us. Uh, let us let us try to support you and the good work you're doing, um, and also understand the impact it has on us, uh, in particular the staff when there is um, tardiness. Thank you. Um, good discussion. Great discussion. Are there any other comments people want to make on that issue or anything else? Well, I like to say, like like Herman, I've been victimized by the feds, and so I wouldn't necessarily <laughs> want to share that victimization. But I, my concern would be really up to staff. I mean, if they can handle an hour or two late with no problem, I'm fine with it. It's no skin off of me. Uh, but if it gets to the point that staff are having problems, I do think we should consider this as perhaps a, a policy area, but I would wait until it's actually creating a problem before coming up with any rules at this point. So, so from what I'm hearing is that there is really no deadline. No, I don't think oh, I hearing, disagree. I don't think you're hearing that, Herman. I don't oh. think you're hearing that. I think you're hearing that there is a deadline, but that the commission's policy is to show discretion on a case-by-case -case basis in line with some of the observations that Bonif Shea made and others. Well, I mean, you, 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 were, you were there at the, at the homelessness uh, uh, committee meeting yesterday where we did reject an application for being uh, late without, significantly late without an explanation. So it's not like we never exercise our discretion and enforce our deadlines. So, so if I have a reasonable explanation, I'm okay. No, I think so. That's my view. Yeah, I just, I mean, I think just, the, the yeah. part where it becomes an issue is even if there's, you know, a reasonable explanation, if it's exceedingly late and it's, as Jim was saying, if it's impacting operations or doesn't give staff enough time to be able to review materials to make that recommendation, then that's when um, maybe it's more of an issue. But, um, you know, uh, an application that's 15 minutes late practically speaking, is not going to impact staff um, the way that's something that is so late, like Dewan was mentioning, if there are certain thing, decisions that need to be made so funding doesn't get hold, held up, you know. Um, what, about, what about all the other organizations that followed the rule and got it in there by five o'clock? Is that discounted? <clears throat> no, I think that I, mean, I think it's a totality i mean if it's an organization that is ongoingly doing this then we need to take that into consideration and take a look at it and we do and historically we have um and communication has been made by staff uh, because the the subcommittee the commission's not been not been happy about that um so i don't think it's it's as um you know uh, how do you say kind of a free-for-all here um, we do have we do have structures in place, and then at the same time, you know who we are as a commission, and the work that we do is also needs to be uh, taken into consideration. And I think that's what you know Corey and uh, Kim and I are trying to to articulate here um, is that how we work with the community is not necessarily the way a federal government would work with, you know, with, with, with someone that these folks are, we're partnered with them, right? And so we wanna make sure they win. Um, we wanna support the work, the great work that they're doing. And it, especially right now, I mean, this is, this is kind of a no brainer right now, but anyway, just uh, want you to know that, no, this isn't just a, happy go lucky whenever you guys like to submit it that would be great with us it's it it, it there are there are structures um and we do adhere to them but a few minutes here and there i think it's it actually serves the the staff to not have to uh pursue that those types of delays or, or tardiness are there any other comments Move to adjourn. Um, Bob, yeah, I was going to say, Bob, to you can make your, make your traditional motion. All right. Well, I don't even think we need to vote. <laughs>
let's just adjourn. How's that? We'll see everybody on November 13th. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.